Welcome to the Women in Public Policy Program Seminar Series Podcast at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, fascinating topic that we have here today. Um, uh, my name is Hannah Riley Bowles. I am research director here at the Women in Public Policy Program. This uh, gives me the opportunity to, uh, to host this seminar. Um, here at WAP, we are focused on closing gender gaps in the areas of economic opportunity, political participation, health, and education. Um, and uh, we make an effort to record all of these um, sessions. So I believe today we'll be um, be on record, so uh, to the extent you want to take that, <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, so I uh, have the honor today of introducing Margaret Jenkins, who is a WAP fellow, but we were really lucky to get her because she's actually um, enjoying multiple appointments um, in, during her this uh, research that she's doing right now. She's also a research associate on peacekeeping with the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. Um, she's also a postdoctoral fellow in the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And Margaret is doing um, uh, fascinating research on um, all female contingents um, on the front lines of peace and conflict, in particular these, these all female peacekeeping contingents. And she is just right now in year one of, a, of an expanding two year um, research agenda. So I'm actually just going to stop there because I'm dying to hear about your research. But okay. work, please join me in warmly. Great. Thanks so Welcome. much. <laughs> thanks so much, Hannah. So thanks for coming. Um, when people often think about peacekeeping, they generally have in mind something that looks a lot like this, blue helmets, United Nations, and male-dominated. Um, and they're not strictly inaccurate about that. Um, less common is to have a picture in mind something like this. This is an all-female unit from Bangladesh, currently deployed in Haiti. And even less common is to have something in mind like this as peacekeeping unit. And this is the unit I'm going to be talking about um, quite extensively today. This is an all-female unit currently working in Mindanao in the southern Philippines, an area that's seen um, a civil war, one of the longest-running civil wars in the world. Um, so it's the main sort of takeaway message. Um, basically just, I hope you see this as a fascinating case that has a lot of insight into how to go about gender mainstreaming peacekeeping and security operations. Just really what that means, what the challenges are, and how one group has tried to overcome those challenges in what appears to be a quite impossible context, as we'll see. Um, I chose this case because this is, as Hannah mentioned, part of a larger project, and this is, I don't, I certainly don't have all the answers, but this is the case I know the best at the current time. There's also a lot of interest in this case because it's not well known at all, because it's not under the auspices of the, the UN, and it's operating in a context of political Islam and also Islamic terrorism in a context with groups that have pledged allegiance to ISIS and other actors. So that, of course, resonates a lot with the current um, you know, interest in conflict. Quickly, I'll just, why am I doing this? And then we'll move right into the case study. And that'll take up the bulk of, I think, the presentation. And then how it fits into my larger research project. <clears throat> Basically, I'm sure a lot of people here are aware of Security Council Resolution 1325. We're about 15 years since the passing of it in 2000. And I, I was working at Uni what was then UNIFEM, now UN Women, at the time when it was passed. And there was just incredible excitement um, about the political consensus of, you know, increasing women's participation in all aspects of security operations and peacekeeping operations and even sort of into military operations. Um, and also just the increased political consensus about the importance of protecting the rights of women and girls um, in all areas of conflict. Um, but in general, even with sort of reasonable expectations of how progress should be, most people are quite disappointed about the level of, you know, the amount of achievements 
uh, the number of achievements that have been made in the last 15 years. Can you speak a little louder? Sure. I don't know if the microphone is on. Sure. I, thanks for mentioning. So just um, basically there's been um, some disappointment about the progress made in gender mainstreaming of peacekeeping operations. And I came across all female contingents and I think this may have and you know my preliminary research seems to suggest it, it I think it offers some innovative insight into why progress is slow at gender mainstreaming in terms of just getting the numbers of women on the ground that we'd like to see and also in terms of the protection of women's rights both um, you know progress has been very ambiguous on that so all female contingents are kind of like in your face gender mainstreaming, right? It's very overt. So it kind of amplifies and magnifies a lot of the gender pressures that are going on. It also lends itself to comparative research because a lot of the all female contingents are operating side by side with what generally are all male contingents or certainly male dominated contingents. So you can kind of see it's, it's kind of set up to be kind of an interesting research design because there's data on how they're doing in one geographical area often <coughs> and their counterparts in another area. This is put up by the UN, but just basically um, in terms of progress being slow, there's only a, a, about, I'm still under 5% of UN peacekeepers are women. Um, so, you know, it's still, there, the goal was to have 20% of at least the police contingents, the police arm of UN peacekeepers, be women by 2015, but that target won't be reached. Um, so I'll just point out here there's some mention of the all female contingents. Um, and I'll return to this, but unfortunately, I don't think you can probably see it very well. But um, I found it interesting, this is often in a lot of the literature on the presence of female peacekeepers. Here it mentions they help reduce conflict and confrontation. And then the other three bullets are to do with their impact on women and girls. So they provide greater sense of security to women and children, improve access and support to local women. So I find it interesting what's chosen to be sometimes kind of the justification <coughs> for, in, in, you know, having more women on the ground. Um, this is basically what I'll cover about the case. Hopefully we can get through a lot of it. Um, and this is them at an official, the official kind of founding of the group in 2010. So Mindanao is an incredibly complex um, region. Basically, the main conflict going on since the 1960s has been the more, what's referred to as the Moro insurgency. So this is, um, there's been a series of Muslim separatist groups that have been fighting the government of the Philippines. Over 100,000 people killed. Um, some of the largest uh, numbers of internationally displaced persons in the world. Um, the primary conflict since the 1980s has been between the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And this is an Islamist separatist group with Islamic separate, um, as political aspirations for the region and the armed forces. Now, it's, it's been at a very positive point. In March of last year, there was a political agreement that was um, not ratified, but it was, it was agreed upon uh, the terms of the political agreement were agreed upon by the government of the Philippines and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. But as even there's still a lot of, um, you know, steps back in the peace process, even with that. And there was an, a major offensive in January where 44 um, special forces of the Philippines were killed in the offensive by Moro Islamic Liberation Front uh, fighters. and. I'll return to who they, the BIFF are a breakaway faction of the Moral Islamic Liberation Front. Um, and I'll just, just, again, I can't really get into the details, but the U.S. has been very involved in counterinsurgency and counterterrorism measures in the region, so they were actually involved in this initiative in January, um, because what happened was the um, Philippine Special Forces were going in to kind of extract a, a terrorist from 
territory rather controlled by the Moral Islamic Liberation Front. So the U.S. Armed Forces were very involved in that. It's a very dangerous region, um, so that's kind of the main conflict going on, but that's kind of the more formalized one, and the Moral Islamic Liberation Front has disavowed terrorism as they're trying to pursue political negotiations, but terrorist groups are rampant in the region, and there's kind of fluid relations between the different groups, which makes it very complicated. So this is why I think it's a very interesting context to have, um, you know, how does an unarmed civilian all-female group operate in a context such as this with um, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, which is an institution that subscribes to conservative gender values um, and, you know, <laughs> not only violence, but conservative sort of gender values are very much common in the region. In terms of where this all-female contingent fits, this is um, kind of the ceasefire monitoring infrastructure, and the all-female contingent is part of the MPC right here, the Mindanao People's Caucus. So these are more govern. This is more a government um, area, but basically, the after the ceasefire was agreed in 2003, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the government agreed to an international monitoring team. Again, not part of the UN, this is a regional team, um, headed by Malaysia. So Malaysia's been the key player in the whole peace process. So the international monitoring team is made up of mostly, almost all soldiers and police from Malaysia, Japan, Norway, a handful of countries that were agreed upon by the two players, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the government. But the, the nature of the conflict is it's operating within a lot of civilian areas. It's densely populated. A lot of villages are caught up in the conflict. And so um, in 2010, so seven years after the international monitoring team was on the ground, a heavily armed uniform, like uniformed force, they decided to start a civilian protection component just to help with monitoring infractions within villages and to be kind of the go-between between, between the international monitoring team soldiers and villages on the ground. So and I think an innovative structure here is these are all, these three are local um, grassroots NGOs in Mindanao that have a long history of being involved in the peace process. And MPC actually ha was already ceasefire monitoring before the international monitoring team asked them to play a role in this formal process. And when they asked them to play this role, they decided to put forward an all-female contingent. And the reasons why they did that are rather interesting, but basically they had, um, oh, I won't, basically they've had, the head of the MPC is a human rights lawyer, and she's been trying to have women play a more prominent role in peacekeeping and ceasefire monitoring in the region for a long time, but was just facing roadblock, constant roadblocks. So when she was invited to put forward a contingent in this formal mechanism, she said, I'm going to put forward an all-female contingent, so I can only female names went forward. And, um, and also, these, this is a Muslim organization, and this is a Muslim organization. This one's more conservative. They are operating in more strictly Muslim regions, and they both have, um, MINRAC has had a couple women, but they've mostly had all male teams. So she thought, well, the other teams are all male, how about I put for an all female team to the international monitoring team. So as you can imagine, she's quite a dynamic, interesting person. In terms of skepticism and resistance, <coughs> I'm sure it comes as no surprise that they faced a great deal of it. Um, I've, I've sort of, this is from mostly interviews, I've broken it down, the major kind of skepticism they've faced. Not surprisingly, um, they haven't felt they haven't been taken that seriously, especially at the beginning, and especially with the soldiers of the international monitoring team. So this was a woman I spoke with who is in charge of the IMT, their relationship with IMT, and just felt, wasn't, you know, laughed at, kind of chuckles when she met with them. The sentiment that they're violating religious doctrine, this is from a fellow partner in the civilian protection component. Okay, this is the Muslim organization, their counterpart. 
when they put forward the all-female contingent, they, set, they called up the MPC who put forward the contingent and said, um, you know, why are you doing this? This is going to create a lot of problems on the ground. It's going to be difficult for us to work together. And of course, they didn't say, um, you know, you you know, you have to subscribe to our religious values, but they said we need a common strategy at this point in the process kind of thing. Um, within local communities, there's a feeling, you know, she's the head of the contingents, a human rights lawyer, subscribes to, to UN, inter, you know, resolutions. It's not really cognizant of local realities. Um, and another kind of major um, point of resistance the group has faced that they're just not tough enough for the job and that they just don't have the right kind of skills or awareness, even in terms of understanding the type of arms the different groups use and things like that. So how have they count, oh, sorry about that. Um, this is just interesting because I think the relationship between the group and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front is a, a, a very kind of fascinating relationship. And I apologize for the long quote, but I think it's interesting to see what their public kind of reaction to the group was. Um, so the first paragraph is basically, you know, we don't really agree that this is the role that women should play in, re in peace in Mindanao. Men and women should play different roles in, and they both have important roles, but they play different roles. And, but then the second paragraph is kind of like, okay, but this has happened, so um, we'll move on. And this paragraph also reflects the fact that the all-female contingent is a local contingent, and they've, they've worked with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front for many years. So <coughs> they, they know Marianne Arnado, they know the head of the contingent quite well, and they've worked Marianne with them. Marianne was the one who fielded the Yeah. She was behind the advocacy for it. She's the secretary general, they call it, of the Mindanao people. <coughs> How do they counter a lot of the, this resistance since 2010? First, just showing on the ground that they're tough enough. So they've done this in quite overt ways. Um, one way, in 2007, before the, f the female contingent was officially accredited, um, there, they the MPC had their ceasefire monitoring teams going on, and a lot of women were involved with that, including Marianne Ornato was, was very involved in ceasefire monitoring in the region. And she, there was this quite um, high profile incident where 10 Philippine soldiers were beheaded um, in a very dangerous region of Mindanao. And of course, this threatened to collapse the whole peace process. There were um, aircraft carriers mobilized in the region for a very swift and strong action against the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. But the MPC and a lot of players in the region worked very hard and held press conferences and called for restraint while they conducted an investigation into the beheading incident. So finally, Manila agreed to an investigation, and it was agreed there'd be somebody from the armed forces of the Philippines, there'd be someone from the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, and then they wanted someone from the international monitoring team, they wanted a soldier from Malaysia or something, but the international monitoring team was in fact not allowed to go because their domestic government said it was too dangerous for them to go to this particular region at this particular time. So what did it Marianne Arnado do? She decided to volunteer to be part of this investigation. So she went with the armed forces and with the Moral Islamic Liberation Front. And of course then she holds a press conference and she really works with them from the inside. And they, their report basically said it was Abu Sayyaf and not the Moral Islamic Liberation Front. Um, I'm still not sure if that's the case, <laughs> but <laughs> it kept the peace process together. Um, <clears throat> this is her here meeting with the head of a breakaway faction from the Moral Islamic Liberation Front um, that recently pledged allegiance to Islamic State. So these are not, you know, particularly welcoming actors. And I just think it's interesting that she 
she puts herself in this position. Um, and she wanted to talk about, you know, what are their aspirations, what are their plans, why aren't they engaged in the peace process. Um, and at first she, after this meeting, she came out with a statement saying, I don't think they're going to frustrate the peace process, I think they're going to come on board. But when they pledged allegiance to Islamic State, and since then she's basically called on the Moro's Islamic Liberation Front to deal decisively with this group before they unravel. And they, they almost did in January with the killing of 44 armed special forces of the Philippines. Um, in terms of, so that's the, you know, trying to prove they're tough enough in the field. Referencing international law, this is the terms of reference. So the group actually fought very hard to have number eight in the terms of reference for the um, civilian protection component of the international monitoring team. Could you read it to us? Sure. Number eight is just the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and Resolution 1820, both to deal with women's participation and women's rights in peacekeeping operations, which protect women and girls from all forms of violence, particularly during and after armed conflict. So they wanted this to be sort of at the top of, it's number eight, you know, it's the last one, but they wanted it in there. And Marianne Arnado, head of the contingent, was actually asked to be on the team drafting this terms of reference, in part because she's a big player in this region. Um, but she's a lawyer, and what happened was she put it in there, and then when they sent the draft to the IMT, they took, she had more references to women in it, and they took them all out, like sent it back, and there was not one, she said, left. But she had already sent it to her contact in the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the government of the Philippines, and they, and she called them up and said they took them all out. So they actually called on the IMT to put them back in. Um, so again, just I think these kind of stories are interesting to see what has to happen in the region. And she has the connections to do it. But it's here, and they actually reference it a lot when the Muslim organization that said we really sh shouldn't, you sh shouldn't really have an all-female contingent because we're not going to be able to work with them effectively and all of these reasons, she, they referred to the terms of reference and said, look, you're, you have to abide by this, and unfortunately we all have to abide by it, and it's here, and it's about that we have to include women, so let's move on. So they do use it um, quite a lot. They also have a network of supportive clerics, Muslim clerics, that they call upon, and this is often when women they work with, including on the contingent, have trouble with some of the responsibilities that they have to perform. So there was a case of one woman, a young Muslim woman, who said, um, you know, I don't think I can talk to um, Islamist fighters and Filipino soldiers because it's against my faith. <coughs> and she had, the quote was, my voice is actually like my hair, and I don't think it can be shown. So Mariano Nato's response was, look, you can cover yourself completely, and you don't have to shake hands, and you don't have to make eye contact, but if you can't talk, you can't be here, basically. But instead of sort of saying, okay, so we'll see you later, the strategy has been to try to keep them on board and to bring in a Muslim cleric. In this particular case, they said, look, there's nothing in the Quran that says you can't talk to soldiers and Islamic fighters, and she continued to participate with the group. But all of these strategies, I have to point out, um, they kind of work against each other, so I think that's why sometimes gender mainstreaming is like one step forward, half a step back. So Marianne Onado and <laughs> others don't like really bringing in Muslim clerics because they see the line between you know, religious authority and patriarchal authority is very thin. And when, you know, for example, when they're showing they're tough enough for the job, that sometimes works against people who want to see them bring in more feminine attributes when they try to bring in more feminine attributes. <laughs> so all their strategies kind of um, have, have a downside. They can't completely win with any of them. Um, the one where they have won almost um, completely, there's no drawback with, with how much time they take on building and maintaining strong relationships. This is the head of the Moral Islamic Liberation Front Peace Panel, so 
the biggest kind of political player on the moral Islamic liberation front. And um, he has a very strong relationship with the contingent and with Marianne Arnado. Um, here he's meeting with Catholic bishops. And I put this, it's hard to get a photo of him with, the, with Marianne Arnado, but um, the contingent was responsible for bringing these players together. And he thanks her publicly here because they called upon the contingent to help them with a bunch of interfaith consultations that um, they had to carry out. Um, and this is largely because the contingent and the organization that put forth the contingent is the major interfaith kind of player in the peace process. Um, the contingent is completely interfaith, completely diverse, and purposefully so. So um, they called upon the contingent to help them with these consultations. All the women I interviewed said they really were, were, were very positive, actually, about the relationship with the Moral Islamic Liberation Front, felt very listened to, um, felt very respected. And again, I think this is quite surprising because they felt far more gender challenges with the international monitoring team than a group that on paper subscribes to very conservative gender roles. This is at a launch. Um, so the IMT, they still are having challenges with, but you know they, they do have a more positive relationship. This is an IMT off soldier here. Um, one problem with the IMT is they're on a rotation of every year. So you know, unlike the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the Armed Forces, they have to kind of build that, you know, go through the learning curve with IMT soldiers every year over again. And this is a local mayor. So again, just showing the amount of time and effort they put into local relationships and getting um, local people on board. At times, they have also used kind of um, essentialist justifications, so the, va the particular values that women can bring to peacekeeping. This is a woman very high level woman involved in the peace process that ha really likes the contingent and came to the launch of the group. Um, and it's, I found this interesting because Arnado um, said she really doesn't like to use this justification, but obviously she does use it in certain cases. And I think the irony here is interesting. It's really, and I'll return to it because it's, it's almost being used by the United Nations, as I mentioned at the beginning, to justify and kind of bring people on board with women being engaged in peacekeeping. But it's like um, kind of, you know, <coughs> affirming women's role, <coughs> primary role as women, um, as mothers and nurturers, to kind of affirm their participation in non-traditional roles. So it's a bit ironic. In terms of gender-based violence, I think um, one quick point about that, in some of the literature on the group, there isn't much literature on the group, but there was a team of researchers from John Hopkins that went and spent time in the region trying to understand the peace process. And it was a good report that they re wrote, but I found it telling that they mentioned in the report there's also this all-female contingent that's been formed to respond to gender-based violence in the region. And I thought, that's interesting. That, so there's a few um, reports of the peace process in the region that kind of assume there's an all-female contingent there, and their role is to respond to gender-based violence, where that's not their role. They have a particular jurisdiction where they're, you know, they're monitoring the ceasefire, just like the other organizations that are. Um, wartime rape and gender-based violence committed by the Moral Islamic Liberation Front and the Armed Forces of the Philippines, it's not pervasive. You know, it's not tremendously pervasive in the region. There is, of course, um, lots of incidents. It tends to come up more with Rito violence, which is kind of clan-based tribal clashes. Um, but the main takeaway message here is there's a lot of reluctance from the other partners to take on the gender-based violence that does occur, and they tend to call on the all-female contingent, even when it's not in their jurisdiction, to take it on. And I found it interesting here that the soldiers are saying, you know, 
basically, can you deal with this one incident we have? There was an incident where one clan raped women in another clan, kind of you know, a, a revenge sort of situation. And they asked the contingent to address it, saying, you know, we're soldiers. We're just really not used to dealing with this. And you know, I find that interesting that they see that. Instead of saying, we're soldiers, and obviously this is something we should be dealing with. So. A lot of people have asked in the past about. Can, can I ask a question? Yeah. Was that? Um, do you think it was? Is there any possibility it wasn't genuine? Meaning, like, you know, they could symbolically have done something about this without ever having to actually do it by sending in the women. In terms of the IMT code. No, no like this incident where there are this this retaliation. Yeah. Right? So we yeah. got to do something. You're right. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's oh, send I see. In the women, you know, yeah. Like they, then, then you know, and then if they're ineffectual, you know, it doesn't, it really, doesn't matter. really matter. We've done something. Yeah. It's not on us. It's on them because yeah. they took responsibility. Well, I, I mean, think I don't know. I think I mean, that's I an know, interesting cynical, point. But, like I, I wonder. If, do, do you have any yeah. sense of the the genuineness of that or of? No, I think they they're not. They kind of just want that problem to go away. You know, they don't. So mm -hmm. it was, I, they were under pressure, it was in the press, Th they're on the ground, so they were under pressure to respond and do something about that incident. So it was kind of like, okay, can you do, like, do an investigation or do something like that? I mean, it's better than nothing. Sorry. Right. Even, no well, matter what their motivations. Yeah. I think yeah. it's better, so they have found the other organizations are kind of doing nothing. So they're not reporting on any gender-based violence um, so they find, you know, the other organizations in the civilian protection. So the IMT kind of feels like they have to do say something or do something, and the others is just sort of silent. Mm -hmm. But there are the Muslim members, especially on the contingent. There are um, examples of them kind of standing up and using their position as part of this international contingent to say, look, there are rape cases in our community, and you know, we can't ignore them any longer. So there are, they, the MBC put forward a report talking about rape in Muslim communities, and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, they had a representative there, said actually that that's not happening, it doesn't happen within like Muslim communities. And the wom a Muslim woman from the contingent stood up and said, it does happen, it's just our culture doesn't. And you know, there, that, there's a lot of examples of that with the contingent, so, which I'll talk about when I talk about the diversity of Muslim women kind of taking the lead with the Moral Islamic Liberation Front and within Muslim communities, and the Christian women taking the lead with armed forces and you know, within Christian, um, more Christian communities. That's what I mentioned here. Diversity is very central to their operations. Um, they're in one of the most diverse regions compared to the other players. Um, it's a long history of sectarian tension. So always if there is, you know, a flare-up of violence, or they have to go visit um, um, MI camps, the, the Muslim women take the lead there, and they always bring along, you know, a Christian, their Christian um, counterpart. And that's on purpose to kind of, you know, show, um, show that an interfaith you know, group can work together to show that, you know, everyone's involved, to show that it's possible, and also so that they can report back to their communities that they were there. Um, uh, in terms of um, cohesion, Basically, the women I interviewed did talk about it being an empowering experience, being part of an all-female contingent, that it's women. But it wasn't as striking as I thought it might be. So, and I think part of that is there's such a diverse unit, and it's an area of such sectarian tension. So for a lot of the women, they had never spoken with someone of a different faith or from a different area of Mindanao. Some of them had worked in diverse groups before, but quite a few of them had not. 
So that has been very challenging. They've, you know, working in an interfaith group. Um, I think this quote reveals something that came up, which was some of the more secular members of the group kind of treated some of what they saw as constraints that the Muslim women had to deal with as sort of outlandish and backward and actually part of their role was to empower the Muslim members to kind of hopefully leave behind some of these constraints. So I found that dynamic rather interesting and important to consider when we're thinking about gender mainstreaming and bringing in women from more cons conservative communities, which is pretty critical given the nature of a lot of conflicts. Um, quick policy lessons about this case. One thing I hope to do by looking at more cases, just what does this all-female model do? What are its advantages, disadvantages? Under what conditions do these hold? I think at this point, an all-female mo model is obviously an a policy option to consider, especially when recruiting women has been extremely difficult. And in this case, it has been extremely difficult to recruit women to be involved on the ground in this capacity. And it's been extremely difficult to recruit Muslim women from more conservative communities. What's the age range? The range from, <coughs> it's, that's also diverse, so the youngest is 22 and the oldest is in her mid-60s. And there's indigenous, they're made up of indigenous people, indigenous women, um, Christian women, and Muslim women, all from Mindanao. Um, I think a key policy lesson in it's all, the standard model is there was a lot of traction the group had, a lot of effecti effectiveness from the fact that they were local. They could harness a lot of these local networks. Um, and also the diversity was key in terms of being able to arrive in a community and have a woman who can speak the language and kind of identify and all these kind of subtle things that are difficult to put that were just working for the group. Yeah, there is, but it's pretty along ethnic and religious lines. So I found it interesting that a lot of the Muslim women spoke to, I said, um, Christian women have it really easy. They can do what they want. And they don't feel they really can um, speak to their, the problems that they have. Um, now, as a quote, an earlier quote I mentioned, Christian women do face some problems just by the fact that they're, some feel like they're kind of speaking with the enemy and they sh this is not the right path. Um, again, there's just a lot, people have all been touched by this conflict, so there's, you know, the fact that it's interfaith is not acceptable to everyone. Uh, in terms of the larger research project, basically I've just, um, put down uh, some of the research questions, sorry, there's this long list, but that these are all taken from the literature on gender and peacekeeping. There's not a literature on all female contingents, but I hope to take some of the hypotheses that have been identified in the literature and bring them to the data, like first of all, get data on all female contingents and bring them to the data. So <clears throat> a lot of, some of this is quite anecdotal, um, about the impact of having women peacekeepers on the ground down to that they'll increase the number of women who will sign up to be police officers, which was arguably a result in Liberia, to they're just better at peacekeeping because there's less infractions, there's less violence, they're less quick to anger. Um, so it's whether the, de you know, the data supports this. Um, other cases I'm looking at, there's a quite kind of a similar diverse unit operating in South Sudan, very grassroots, was already kind of doing it, just like the group I was talking about. They were doing it with no money, doing it just trying to hold it together, doing it because they had to. And now they've been recognized internationally and have hooked up with the nonviolent peace force. Um, and then I'll look at the UN, all female units, which there's Bangladeshi unit in Haiti and the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, and an Indian unit in Liberia. 
So there's a lot of different cases of women organizations being involved in peace, and there always has been, but I'm, look, I'm trying to find ones that are <coughs> really engaged in conflict zones and have sort of clear kind of peacekeeping functions. If we have time, I'll play, this is a, a short clip. Um, I think we have, it's very short, but um, I don't know if it's still Oscar season, but there's, a, <laughs> I guess it's not, but the woman, there's a woman making a film on all-female peacekeeping contingents, um, Charmaine Obeyed Chinoy, and she won an Oscar Best Short years ago for another film called Saving Face, which was on acid throwing, and she's, she's a great filmmaker. So she's, she's doing this film. Um, it'll give you a sense of the difference from, a, like, a, I think, a UN unit to a grassroots one. I don't know if this sounds on. You can't blow it up so we can read the surtitles? Sorry. I don't know. He was shot by terrorists while on duty, so I discontinued my studies and went straight to the police to help my family. So my husband does not want me to go at all, and he was very angry. He didn't speak to me for a month and a half. I'm going to Haiti. It's very painful to leave my children behind. I worry about my younger son forgetting me, about him forgetting me. In July, they, her unit left for Haiti. Um, so I, I think one thing that that I think case makes obvious is it's going to be an extremely different case because they're a foreign, it's the more traditional, they're a foreign unit. So that will be one of my interests um, in terms of how much harder it is for an all-female contingent operating in a foreign context. Um, just remaining kind of lingering puzzles, data collection is proving to be very difficult. I'm relying on interviews right now, just in terms of releasing reports. <coughs> um, I just mentioned, in case anyone has any ideas. Limits to pluralism in gender mainstreaming. I think this is an interesting question um, that kept coming up. Um, basically, I kind of see an analogy to uh, development in some ways, in terms of there's been great development projects, but Right now, there's a concern that a lot of development projects kind of leave, leave behind pockets of extreme poverty where wim there's a lot of women. And I think a similar thing is happening in gender mainstreaming peacekeeping operations because of women from very conservative contexts and conservative families, it's very difficult for them to be engaged. Um, and just, I think, it, how to engage them is, in, is this case is kind of interesting on that. Growing consensus on gender, mainstreaming can mass dissent. This was clearly happening a bit in the region. Um, the contingent mentioned a lot of the conservative groups they worked with sort of talk the talk now of, oh, it's great you're here and it's great. But um, especially the Moral Islamic Liberation Front feels under pressure to do that. But um, even though they're happy they're on board, it's quite superficial. They actually don't agree with Security Council Resolution 1325. So I think that we have a problem right now with this pressure to adhere to it can mask dissent and actually kind of some engagement on what are their concerns. And I think like when we talk about progress not happening, um, I think sort of bringing these real concerns and actually talking about, well, why are you not engaged, why, you know, we have to be talking about what's really happening. Uh, tension between advocacy and research, 
some, I talked to a high level person in the UN and I found it interesting she's really not supportive of looking at the effectiveness of the unit and I've come across this quite a bit. I think there's this feeling that um, we're just trying to get women on the ground, you know, and we don't want to find that they're not doing something. That's not what we, that's not where we should be putting our attention, finding what they're not doing well. And I think that's very interesting because it, first of all, neglects that this is more to do with gender than to do with women. So if, there, if something's not going well, it probably has mostly to do with the, the context within women are operating and what has to change than the fact that women don't make good peacekeepers. But because so much of the advocacy is about how women are good at peacekeeping, um, you know, anything that sort of suggests complexity of that. And that's related to just our essentialist research findings problematic. Um, basically that's just, there's a lot of trying to show that women, when women are engaged, violence against women is more reported, they're better at responding to it. Um, so just I think this can be problematic in terms of gender mainstreaming across the whole mission that everyone's responsible for doing that. And it also is a bit problematic in terms of you know, showing that women can actually be good peacekeepers in every aspect of peacekeeping. And I just put this because this is kind of standard how you de they often depict a women peacekeeper, kind of with a child or, you know, helping another woman. Or, um, anyway, but thank you very much. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Charles Fletcher, and I actually just finished doing my Peace Corps service in the Philippines. Great. And I worked a lot with uh, teachers and youth from Mindanao through a lot of my work, so I'm actually really fascinated in what you're doing with this. Um, I kind of have like a loaded question. It's a little complicated, and I'll try and simplify it. Because in the examples you gave, it seemed that you kind of distinguish between grassroots, non-militaristic um, contingency groups, and then um, more foreign militarized ones. And obviously, in Mindanao, it's, you have the tensions with different cultural and religious groups as well. Um, can you give us any insight into the effectiveness or um, what, what do you see going forward between the difference of these grassroots, non-militarized, or foreign militarized groups? Well, I'm actually surprised that an unarmed civilian unit can get the kind of traction that they can. <coughs> And it'll be interesting to look at the case of Sudan, South Sudan, where, um, you know, whether they can get the same kind of traction. Um, there's a lot of literature about whether weapons are actually, you know, worse. And I am, th in terms of being able to perform the peacekeeping mission, um, does it just inflame? Does it just, you know? increased tension right away. So it'll be interesting to look at that. What, you know, if, if I can get the data on um, that. But a lot of the peace, in terms of a lot of the reasons why there hasn't been effectiveness in peacekeeping, a lot, often there's a lot of problems with weapons, weapons and fractions, wep, you know. So it just escalates the interaction right away of a peacekeeper in a certain context that this, this group does not, you know, does not deal with. Do you want Sure. Hey, Lisa. Me? You're sure, Lisa, yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. I had never heard of this group, so I'm really totally fascinated by what you're describing here in the Philippines, but I have to admit I'm also a little confused. And I was listening to you, I was kind of asking myself, well, what actually is this an instance of? You call it peacekeeping, but then the one thing that confuses me is that the UN is kind of not there with the whole, you know, normative superstructure that comes with that certain law and systems. But, but the, the other thing that, that uh, I find even more confusing. 
interesting is precisely the fact that this is people from the different sides, not necessarily the different factions, but certainly from the different sides that are supposedly at conflict in this local environment and participate in, in this group. And so I, I'm asking myself, you know, is this not more of an instance, or is this not more akin to what in other contexts women's organizations, women's peace organizations have tried to do? I mean, I'm thinking about Liberia and the organ, uh, uh, Lema Kobe organizing women mm -hmm. across, across uh, factions, or you have the women's situation groups in, in, uh, in West uh, Africa, again, with the, precisely the, the, F, the emphasis being on let's organize across factions and in that way show that collaboration is possible and let's capitalize <coughs> on the notion of femininity and women being not political to kind of push forward a peace process. Mm -hmm. so, so my question is, maybe this, this is not peacekeeping. Is this really peacekeeping in the sense mm -hmm. in which we call it sensitivity? Think about peacekeeping and why do you call it? Well, I call it peacekeeping because they call themselves peacekeepers and they're known as sort of a peacekeeping contingent within the rhetoric of the international monitoring team. There's not really a concrete definition of what a peacekeeper is because it's not about whether you're armed or not. It's not whether you're with the United Nations or not because there's a lot of peacekeepers engaged in regional forces. Like there's African Union peacekeepers that happen to be armed and look more like our standard idea of what a peacekeeper looks like. But basically, um, and you're right, and this group does take their, they're aware of a lot of the other initiatives and they actually have relationships with other women's groups that are interfaith and have sort of brought together, um, you know, the sort of warring factions as a statement and also as thinking that's the only way to move forward. Um, so they do dialogue with them, but a lot of those groups are not officially part of a ceasefire monitoring mechanism that has a terms of reference that it involves the same kind of responsibilities and roles that a formal peacekeeping um, mission has. So, you know, the, this group in their terms of reference is, you know, they have to go into civilian communities that are displaced and sort of receive reports of violence incidents from the armed forces, from the Moral Islamic Liberation Front, and they're called upon, they're called when by civilian communities that hear, like the, a lot of their role is, is there's rumors, because a lot of violence comes from rumors, that they're going to be attacked, or there'll be actual shells coming towards a village, like nearby, and they'll call on the contingent, often first, <laughs> because they know them, and they'll say, we are actually being fired on right now, or we heard that they're gonna come tonight because so-and-so is hiding here or so they'll call on them and then the contingent has their formal mechanism to alert the international monitoring team about that and um, so they act as the go-between between the soldiers that are part of the international monitoring team and that they report directly to the moral Islamic Liberation Front and the government peace panel so you know, they report directly as part of the peace process. So that becomes part of what's talked about in the peace process. So a lot of this came about because soldiers were not doing a good, soldiers from other countries, Malaysia, were, it was very hard for them to kind of go into a civilian community and, you know, and there was this local groups on the ground. So they decide to let's work with them and their networks to get that information and so that we can respond more quickly because no one knew how to even call the IMT or talk to, you know, talk to them. So. Yeah, what do you mean? I'm so interested by your, um, your, your, your problem of talking about them without essentializing them as women, you know, like, for what it's worth, I think that film clip really is essential. I mean, right. there's, there's, it's, it's, it's very painful for men to go away to, Right, peacekeeping situation for a year, and then you know men wonder if their children are going to know them a year later, and 
Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so we have to sort of be careful about what it, the reason why I mention it is. I think it, it fundamentally relates to the narrative. Like, there's actually I don't think there's anything wrong with showing that these women can do things that the men can't do. But the question is, it are they do are they doing things the men can't do because of some biochemical capacity for love or oxytocin or whatever it is, you know, or is it because they have, um, you know, special experiences or insights or perspectives or at a capacity to make identity-based connections that have not been, that has not existed before? I mean, I think you, could, you can get into, you know, mm -hmm. an identity and diversity-based narrative that explains why this, this is, this is, this is a, a set of perspectives, this is a set of you know, this is a you know group representation that's missed that's been absent in the past in the process, and then by bringing this representation, this perspective, this you know, um, you're able to get at things, which which then I think potentially raises it to a higher level of learning, right? So maybe right. this is maybe this is a broader problem about bringing in foreign peacekeeping troops. You know, maybe it doesn't mm -hmm. always have to be the women who form these, you know, these diverse mm -hmm. you know grassroots organizations. It can be Groups of priests, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But but it, you can sort of get at larger, right. larger questions of identity and representation and um, uh, trust building for mm -hmm. you know peacekeeping and stuff like that. That 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 doesn't that gets beyond the essentializing. I mean, I I, th I think mm -hmm. I mean it's a wonderful. I, I I love that you're kind of grappling with it, but I just have this faith that you can you can do it. You know, I think yeah. you can tell a theoretical story. About why they're why they're so special that leads to conclusions that have much broader, you know, yeah. relevance to peacekeeping than right, you know, right. Women have greater capacity for love due to child rearing or something. Yeah, yeah. I do. I find that. I mean, I'd like to hear it, Dara. So I think that a quick point on that is just <laughs> I do feel that. If you show that they're better at this, I mean, they're be the violence, it goes up, and that's kind of um, reports of violence against women goes up. It's thought of, okay, that's success, you know, that's success because we put women there and now it's better for women that they're there. But you could tell a completely different story that, well, you know, why is that success, you know? Um, you, why does that have to be something you know the women have to do and in t in the case of this contingent because they had to do it because no one else was doing it it made their job harder like in terms of their uh, they had to do what everyone else was doing plus take on gender-based violence right so it's not that you're, they either only have to do the gender-based violence stuff, and that's a lot of work in itself, or they have to do that plus everything else. And so it's hard to be as effective. And I think it, you know, it's just kind of interesting. If they're better at it, it's, it's not necessarily, in my view, if they're better at it, it's not because women are better at it, it's because the men haven't been doing it. Well, that's the point, right. exactly. Like, so what, what why are we, st the, the policy before. lesson's not to just put more women there so it gets it done. The policy lesson is to make sure when women see a male soldier, they don't say, wow, that's scary, there's a male peacekeeper in my town, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry. I think it's, it's difficult for us to say yet that there's even a story to tell because yeah. we just there's so much we don't really know about the effectiveness of female peacekeepers um, right and I know that you're aware of this literature because we've talked about it but there's a growing literature to, to suggest that women are not more effective than men right? right and it's very hard to study this because these units aren't sent to the same places that the men are sent to and they don't perform the same kinds of tasks right. that the men are sent to um, the, my comment was kind of related to, kind of jumps off of what Hannah's point was, but I was wondering if you could go back to the slide that came from the UN website where we sure. see the, all the data. And it was, it, what wasn't clear to me, are, are these kind of assumptions about all of these wonderful benefits that women will have, or are these based in studies that the UN has done where we actually can say that women have had an effect in particular cases? Um, right. Because part of what concerns me, and it gets back to one of your last bullet points, is this tension between advocacy and, and research. 
and you know, as a scholar, I find it very upsetting that the UN doesn't even want to know the answer here. Probably mm -hmm. because they're fearful that the answer is that these women have no effect. Right. Um, and part of the story that they're telling here is that these women have all of these wonderful benefits. Right. Um, I think there's even a, an interesting yeah. sort of separate project or separate paper that you could write about why why the UN, on the one hand, would have a slide like this. Um, mm -hmm talking about all of these great benefits, but on the other hand, not be very supportive at all about any kind of real evaluation of the effect of right. these first. Yeah. For a story about the kind of strength of gender norms or the fear of not wanting to find a right. result here. Yeah. Yeah, I think I was very struck by it. Um, it was very, when I, in my conversation with this official, you know, she, she liked other parts of the research, but she definitely didn't want, she thought, you, you know, we cannot be asking, like, whether they're effective. We're not there. Like, we're just trying to get them on the ground. Um, but that it was, and, and that's not. Unfair, because you're, if you're not doing studies of particular male peacekeeping, you know, I mean, asking how effective they were. You know, right. I, mean, I, I do think it goes back to no, the narrative. No, it's true. Like, what part of the narrative you're, you're telling, but. Um, it will be comparative. Like, I'll look. And I explain, and then she was more on board. Like it's explaining the differences, but it's just I think I think it's just interesting to think this. Um, most people doing work on gender are feminists. Most doing research, and I think it is this pressure that you can use the results to promote the cause. I think it it does affect the research. Um, so I think I think it's um, interesting, but also just the fact that well, what if we find they're not effective in this one way? Why is that? Some why does that say anything about women? It doesn't necessarily have to say anything about women. It has everything to do with gender mainstreaming. So then the question is, well, why aren't they effective? They probably aren't effective because I can't believe in, they are effective at all, given the number they given that it's way harder to be a woman peacekeeper than a male peacekeeper. So it's amazing that, you know, so the, but the effectiveness question is more to get at that. It's to get at, and I, you know, and we had this kind of interesting discussion. Well, you know, we have had advocacy for a long time. We have, you know, I think we need to know what's happening. We need to know what, you know, why it's not happening. At the very least, we should have an empirical basis for making right. claims that when we have female peacekeepers, yeah. there's more reporting of gender-based right. violence. So that's an empirical question. I know. And on your other question, I find the empirical, even you know, the research on are women sent to, uh, do women <laughs> do, and that's one of my research questions to look at, do they do less dangerous work? So there's papers that say, OK, women are getting on the ground, but maybe the terms of reference look similar. But when they get on the ground, they're kind of not going out on that deployment or you know, so, and then there's also research to suggest they're not sent to as dangerous places. So, but that even that research is not, it's not that substantial. It's not, there's not a lot of it. And, you know, it was a regression involving very little variation, small sample size. So, we do, like, we don't know, we don't know a lot. Um, we don't know a lot yet about it. I'll set myself ahead, <laughs> but, but this is so, um, but the thing is particularly because of the small n, you know, and there, there's so much variation, you're, you're probably not going to actually be able to do very, like the empirical, empirical is absolutely really important, but I think what's crucial is that it, it's, it's fundamentally, you, you need to be theory driven because the data that you're going to get are not going to be, like they're not going to be slam dunk, there's going to be, it's going to be very hard if not impossible to compare you know, control samples of men and women right. doing the identical thing right. in sufficient numbers to actually say whether or not men or women are better at doing X. I mean, it's just not going to exist. So when you're, I think what's, what's really important is that as you develop your narrative about that, that it is theoretically informed by larger concepts like <coughs> status and, you know, yeah. identity and things that are bigger than the sort of essentialist theories so that you can get to something that's higher level than, you know, d you know does it matter if you have women? Do you, do you know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. I think, I think your, the, the theory that you construct is going to could be um, is very important for the you know the the you know conceptual integrity and sort of what you can say from your data. You know? Right. Yeah. No, that's a good point. 
And some of these missions are working, like in this particular mission, they're not doing, they're in more, it, you could make a case that they're actually operating in a more dangerous region than the all-male groups, just because the, they're the interfaith pe peacekeeping unit. So, and if, and th that data is there, you can look at number of infractions and, you know, the papers that have been written on this, the, often the data is not that, it was, it's a bit dated before the peacekeeping mission. And, but in this case, it, that it doesn't hold. We'll see in Haiti um, if that's the case, and Liberia. And you can look at the regions where they've been deployed, and there is data on are these are they similar? But obviously, you can't. You know, they're not going to be exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, Lisa. I think it is. It's really, really fascinating. I have two questions. The first one is: Could you tell a little, a little bit more about? Michael? recommendations do you think your project can generate which you speculate about that it's, it's a tough one but yeah um, <clears throat> well in terms of um, the how this came about so I'm a political theorist by training I like you know but I did also the you know the methods courses here at Harvard actually and my husband actually he's a methodologist and a statistician <laughs> so it's strange the kind of education that goes on <laughs> from just you know talking to him about this but I'm a political theorist by training so that's why um, and my so my dissertation was very very abstract very theoretical I defended it while I was living in Southeast Asia in 2010 um, and I had long had, you know, um, interest in gender research, mostly because I'd worked in policy, like with Canadian International Development Agency and, as I mentioned, with UNIFEM, but I have never done research on gender um, or empirical work on gender. So I'm coming at this new, but I had my, my thesis, I'm, you know, in Southeast Asia working on this really abstract political theory paper lecturing at Vietnam National University, which itself is a strange story because it's a completely Marxist uh, mm -hmm. university. All this to say, when I defended, I was like, I have to do something more <laughs> policy-oriented and more empirical. And um, a friend of mine at the U.S. Institute of Peace and at Georgetown, they were putting out this call for interesting cases at the intersection of religion and conflict and women. And I came across because I was living there, this really small newspaper article about this contingent. And right away I was thinking, well, how does this work? I mean, it must be impossible. I don't really understand. Why did it come about? And is this just token? Is there, are they really doing anything? And um, anyway, it just went from there. I, I emailed them. I talked to them. I wasn't going to go because of security situation, and I'm just a strange political theorist living in Vietnam <laughs> and, you know, the other people going there are, are with complete armed, you know, situation. But um, I did go and ended up being great. I mean, it was life changing really to meet them. That it was the worst of circumstances. Both my children, I've, I had young children at the time, and I got to the Philippines because my husband had this work retreat with the World Bank in the Philippines. So I thought I just have to take this little flight down to Mindanao. Turns out both my children had this huge fever. And so then I'm heading out to visit this group that I barely know in a conflict zone. And I'm thinking, I'm a, what am I doing, you know? <laughs> and I'm walking down the hallway, leaving them behind. And then I get there, and the tsunami hit. It was in 2011 when I first visited them. So then I'm stuck in the southern Philippines at the Davao airport with everyone else looking at CNN, trying to figure out where the waves are gonna go. So it was a very strange beginning of the research, but in, in terms, I mean, I think some of the lingering questions are coming because as a political theorist, that's just kind of where my mind often goes. 
Um, what are we really talking about in gender, and why is this going on, and why is the UN talking about it this way, and, and um, you know, is this going to be possible to mainstream, and who are we mainstreaming, what kind of women, and what are they, we asking them to do? Like, all those kind of questions are in the back of my head when I'm interviewing. But uh, the research proposal and the research will be empirical in the sense it'll be trying to do match, you know, in terms of the methodology, it'll be a lot of interviews and as much data I can get, and then um, trying to compare, you know, either it'll be kind of a matching situation. So if there's an all-female contingent here, I'll try to match it with a regular contingent working under very similar circumstances and just see what the data looks like in terms of, and then see if we can find out anything. But it will be also trying to present some new data because there's just not a there's no not a lot of data. Again, because of things Dara's mentioned before, I think even the data collection is there's this overpowering emphasis on advocacy even in the data collection. So it's like, um, you know, it, there's just this strong pressure to kind of show that women are good at it. So it's been hard to get. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. I'm curious to know about the reaction within the military confines of treating a unit of unarmed female peacekeepers like some sort of highly specialized weapon that adds value to the military and internationally armed forces? Or is it more like treating them like some sort of highly valuable resource? that they then have to add more armed contingents to protect. So that's something that I guess I didn't quite get the sense of uh, as far as you were saying they have to do the same things, um, but then add a whole women's job of right. sexual violence. Yeah. <laughs> so what is it in terms of balancing out the unarmed contingents with the armed contingents? Right. In this, in the, this case, the IMT tries not to be armed, except in certain circumstances. They have to be armed, obviously, because, um, and the, I mean, uh, unarmed, these groups are caught in the crossfire. They're actually, you know, because this case, I mean, this, Mindanao has, as I mentioned, like, it's a tremendously, the conflict is tremendously en enmeshed in civilian communities. So it just happens, and there's a lot of terrorists that the armed forces wants that hide in civilian communities, and so they're, it's just very much, you know, par for the course. So, um, but in terms of the other groups that are involved in peacekeeping, they're not armed either, and the IMT tries not to be armed either. So the major armed players are um, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. They're they're still very much armed, and there's and the armed forces of the Philippines, and then there's um, a quite a significant U.S. presence there engaged in counterinsurgency and counterterrorist um, operations. In fact, you know, there's a lot of criticism in the Philippines about the U.S. role in this recent um, incident in January, just arguing they don't really understand the dynamics on the ground, that you have to kind of talk to the Moral Islamic Liberation Front before you go in there to try to extract a terrorist, but uh, that the peace process is just still there's not a lot of trust, and especially I can imagine the U.S. military was sort of like, we just want to get, we know where they are, and we just want to get in there overnight, kind of thing, get them out, and of course, that didn't work. So, and it, it could potentially collapse the whole thing. But the, there isn't, the IMT is armed when, the, when it's reached a certain point of escalation, like they were armed in that case, but the P, um, and they're, um, they're not really referred to as peacekeepers as much, um, but um, they're the only armed players in the region. Um, yeah. We're at the end of our hour. Okay. Thank you so much. It's just so awesome. <laughs> um, for a dramatic change of pace, I see I'm on next week. <laughs> um, talking about the latest research on. Uh, <coughs> Uh, women or gender and career negotiations, and I'll have a, a kind of workbook so that students can think about applying the research to their own, or anybody applying the research to their own career negotiations. So that's the plan for next week. So thank you all again. Thank yeah. you.
Thank you.